you get that suit? That's the question I'm asked when I, when I wear this suit. But ladies and gentlemen, you don't get this suit. You don't go into Kohl's or Target or Walmart and buy this suit. You don't order it on Amazon and have it shipped to your house. This is a suit that you have made. This is, to use a buzzword, a bespoke suit. And now I'm going to speak about why having this suit made to wear on the radio is the dumbest thing I ever did. <laughs> now, I'm a kid that grew up with a radio in one hand and a tape recorder in another. And uh, I, I got bit early by the radio bug. I lied to get onto my local Long Island radio station. I lied. I said I was a vandal. I had never vandalized anything. And I went on and I talked and I was in front of a microphone and I liked it. Flash forward to 1986, I moved to New Jersey. I end up on this legendary freeform radio station, WFMU. And on WFMU in 1989, I start doing a talk show, Aerial View. Friday nights at six o'clock, I rant, I rave, I take phone calls from people, I'm extemporaneous, I'm spontaneous, other words that end in O-U-S. And I realize this is what I'm good at. But it never occurred to me that I could make money in radio. I'm working at a paper company, not unlike Dunder Mifflin, and then they get sold, and I'm out of work. And through connections, I end up freelancing for National Public Radio. I end up on 2nd Avenue at their New York bureau, and they send me out on the subway to go and stick a microphone in, somebody, in somebody's face, and I do this for a few years, and I'm barely scraping by, borrowing money from everybody I know. And then finally, I end up with a part-time job, I move indoors, I'm in the control room, I'm cutting tape with a razor blade, I'm working with all these incredible smart people on shows like All Things Considered and Morning Edition, and then I hit the jackpot, they hire me full time, I'm working on every public radio show you ever heard of, Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, This American Life, Car Talk, you name it, I've done it. And then finally we get the union in, and I got job security, baby. I got regular pay raises. I can't be fired for just any reason. I mean, the extent of the career advice I got as a kid was my grandmother saying, get a job at the post office, you'll have a pension. So this is the pinnacle for me. And then trucking radio calls. One day in 2005, this friend of mine calls me. He knew me from my talk show. He said, I want you to come over to this new thing, Sirius Satellite Radio, and I want you to co-host a daily phone-in talk show. And I'm thinking, wow, fantastic. But I got a union job now. And for weeks I'm agonizing. What do I do, what do I do? I call everybody I know, I pester everybody. I'm thinking, how can I leave this job with all this security and go walk out on this wire without a net with the possibility of this show being canceled in a couple of months? But ladies and gentlemen, I couldn't do anything else. I wanted to be on the air, that was it for me. So, I go and do this thing, trucking radio, which is decimating terrestrial radio, because trucking radio is on satellite radio means you could drive from New York to California and listen to the same damn thing. You never have to worry about the station fading out. This is a godsend for truck drivers. And I'm thinking, how hard can it be to talk to truck drivers? I, blew, I, I grew up blue collar. My father was a mechanic. I could relate. I could relate. I mean, these are some of the most conservative people I ever talked to. They would say these incredibly racist, misogynist, homophobic things, and then they would add, just telling it like it is. <laughs> like, like, that took care of everything. And so I said to myself, I gotta do something to relate to these people. I gotta figure out something to do that's gonna make them like me. And I don't know what it is yet, but then my boss says, we're going to Trucking's family reunion. We're going to the biggest truck show of the year. We're going to Louisville, Kentucky. Thousands of truck drivers gather from all over for, a, for three days, and they bring their kids, and they go and they get all the swag, what we call future landfill in my house, all these plastic promotional items, and they look at the new trucks, and they're gonna come see you do a live broadcast. So that's the first light bulb goes, goes off. The second one is, I'm at the Meadowlands Flea Market on a Saturday morning, and I see this set of kids' curtains with CB themes all over them with trucks and CB lingo. Now, you know, the CB was always known to truck drivers, but then in the 1970s, it burst into the public consciousness through 
songs like Convoy and TV shows like Moving On and movies like Smokey and the Bandit. Now everybody had a CB and kids had curtains in their bedroom with CBs all over them that you probably got from J.C. Penney or Sears. But I look at these curtains and I think, Nudie the Rodeo Taylor. Now, Nudie the Rodeo Taylor is not a tailor that worked nude at the rodeo. This was a guy that made custom suits for the biggest stars of country music, and they would wear them on the Grand Ole Opry, and they would look fantastic. But Nudie the Rodeo Taylor has been dead. I don't know who else does this, except for one woman I've known for many years. Met her when she was going to FIT. She's now making custom clothing for rock stars. Joan Jett and Cheryl Crow and Steven Tyler are buying her clothes, and I call her up and I say, Carla, I have these curtains, see, and I want to make a custom suit. And she says, come on by, and I go to New York, and I bring a book of all these custom suits, and I bring pictures, and uh, she takes all these measurements of me, and I say, how much? She says, I don't know, it's going to be like a thousand, fifteen hundred, somewhere around there, and I, I go hard, and I'm thinking, can I really do this? Is it really worth it? And then she says a couple of words to me that are magic. She says, it's, you know, it's tax deductible. It's, it's stage wear. If you wear it on stage, it's tax deductible. So I call up Howie the Angry Accountant. We call him that because every time we go to do our taxes, he reminds me that we're in end stage capitalism. So, you know, he says it's true. If you wear it to a live event, you can deduct the cost of any stage wear. So I'm thinking, Mid-America Trucking Show, right? We're going there in March. I'm going to wear the suit. Wait until they get a load of me. Wait till these truck drivers see me. So uh, it gets to be March. I pack the suit up. We fly to Louisville. And uh, I'm deciding Saturday's the day. All the truck drivers bring their families on Saturday. We're going to be in front of all these people. I find a men's room to go change in. That's the only place where I have any privacy. I'm in this tiny stall. I'm trying to put this damn thing on without stepping in the toilet. And I got the right hat. I got the silver barrel belly Stetson like LBJ wore. And I come out and I think I'm looking fantastic and I'm doing my triumphal walk through all the truck drivers as far as the eye can see. And I notice that they're looking at me funny. They're staring at me and they're, they're pointing and they're snickering and they're whispering to each other and the vibe is really weird and, and hostile and I don't understand what's going on. And then I see the oldest truck driver sitting there on a low ledge and this guy looked older than dirt, nicotine stained fingers. I walk over to him and I think I startle him because I lean down and I go, what's so funny? And he goes, good buddy. I said, what? Good buddy. Yeah, good buddy, good buddy, good buddy. He's pointing out all the good buddies on my suit. I, I go, yeah? You know what good buddy means, don't you? No. It means you want to meet a man in the bathroom and have sex. And I go, oh my God. Oh my God. I can't wear this thing. I can't wear this suit. I see, I see 27... I see $2,750 with wings on it flying away and I'm thinking tax deductible. I can't wear this thing and I'm headed back to the bathroom to take it off. Someone taps me on the shoulder and I turn around, I'm angry now and I go, what? And it's this middle-aged woman, she's with a little eight-year-old kid and he's trying to hide behind her and she, she comes over and she says, he wants to take a picture with you. And I'm like, oh my God. And my defenses fall, and I'm like, all right. So we sit down next to the old truck driver with the nicotine-stained fingers, and he moves away from me. And we take a picture, and I say to this woman, loud enough for him to hear me, I say, come see us at 11 a.m. We're going to be on the air. And at 11 a.m., I go on the air. I tell the whole story. I take it. I turn it into radio gold. For the next three hours, we talk about it. We laugh about it. We have a great time about it. I still wear the suit, but I don't work in trucking anymore. And now when I wear it out to a place like this, I don't get asked if I know what good buddy means. I get asked, where'd you get that suit? Thanks. <laughs>